welcome to the Philly logo this year. Uh, it is a truly special occasion. I think it's the first time in my four years I've seen it, like an all-black tie event uh, in the <laughs> chamber. Uh, so uh, before we begin, it is of course a rare privilege tonight uh, to have one of the, the really great field guests in our history uh, tonight, Professor Dawkins, with us. I uh, hope you'll be receiving the gold medal on your patients later. Uh, first of all, just to run through the order of business. Um, since it is the inaugural, we have a few formalities. Uh, so first of all, I'll be calling on the registrar for the minutes of the last inaugural. And then we'll be awarding the Oratory and Composition Medals uh, from, the, from, from 327 and 328. Uh, and then uh, we'll be making a, a speech sort of to address the society of the reflection of the year uh, and then to introduce Professor Dawkins. And then we'll move on to the main part of the evening uh, where Professor Dawkins will be addressing the society on Darwin's Five Bridges uh, and then there'll be Q&A after that. If you'd like to think of questions you'd like to ask Professor Dawkins. And then we'll conclude the event by awarding the Gold Medal on your patient. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to call upon now at the registrar to read the, problem, the, the, sorry, read the minutes of the last uh, novel. The inaugural meeting of the 327th session of the University Philosophical Society took place on the 13th of March 2012 in the exam hall, with ex-president and sadly ex-hottie Ono oh, Lehon in the chair. <laughs> the minutes were read but never signed because the supposed host for the evening, David Norris, was too intent on hogging as much intention as possible for himself to do what he was meant to be doing, which was hosting the event. <laughs> the title for the inaugural was a paper entitled A Pluribus Unum, out, out of Many, One, delivered by United States Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. After a 17 minute standing ovation for Lita Pelosi, we <laughs> began with Senator Norris opening with what he called a few words. Unfortunately, no one remembered to turn on his subtitles, so all we heard was, Rah, 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 Linda Hogan then made what I can only assume was a deeply ironic speech about how the Provost is being the defender of the Phil's right to free speech, <laughs> sending apologies for the Provost himself, who was too busy being hot, boring, and a douche to attend. <laughs> then President O'Leary was the next to speak, who, after giving a wonderfully self-indulgent history of the Phil, introduced Leader Pelosi by comparing the United States government to the Phil itself. <laughs> I was quite happy with this comparison, as I can only assume that he's referring to the obvious similarities between myself and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Catherine Sabone, or KZ as she's known in the Dublin rap scene, was the first guest speaker of the night. She spoke about how she balls so hard, motherfuckers want to find her. Most of the chat about Greek human rights work. And if you have girl problems, feel bad for you, son, because she got 99 problems of bitch wing one. So she broke the head of a of change to society by becoming the first senator in a same sex marriage. Go her. Following her was the Bostonian with the Mostonian, Dr. Lawrence Donnelly. His speech was boring and his accent was rank. But I really enjoyed watching him during other speeches because his chair was a little too high for him and his feet didn't actually touch the ground. So he sat there swinging them back and forth. And you can tell that he was happy as Larry to be there. It's funny because his name was Larry and he's actually happy, but there you go. Then at last, Speaker Pelosi took to the podium to make her address. She spoke for about 20 minutes, though at least half that time was spent on giving each member of her ridiculously large delegation an individual round of applause, which included seven congressmen, three grandchildren, two Secret Service members, a personal doctor, two flatmates in college, one niece, an acquaintance daughter, and of course, a healthy dollop of American ignorance. The rest of the world focused on democracy and the links between Ireland and America, calling the 40 million people who, who identify as Irish American in the US as links between the two countries, although at least three quarters of these links are along the lines of Oh my god, you're Irish, I'm like Irish. My great granddaughter's fourth cousin once removed his third husband dog is one fourteen times. And most of them are a But she finished up by calling herself a fresher of the college, intent on learning as much as possible while she was here. Though so the only thing you learn from freshers in Trinity is how to cultivate the most withering stare while rolling a cigarette, how to present yourself in the most sexually ambiguous way possible. <laughs> Finally, after another standing ovation, Leader Pelosi was presented with the honorary patron of the society by Ono, and the meeting was closed with Senator Norris making a slightly racist impression of an Indian man who once worked at a hotel he stayed in, for a living in Genoa. There would be no further business, the meeting adjourned.
composition medals are the highest accolade that the Phil awards to its student members. This evening, with one medal of composition to award for excellence in paper reading is selected by the Bram Stoker Paper Reading Club, and three medals of oratory for excellence in chamber speaking at our Thursday night chamber debates. So, the silver medal of composition for the 327 session this evening will be awarded to the paper Deconstructing Patriarchal Linguistic Mechanisms for Hegemonic Maintenance by ex librarian, ex MC, HMC, Seamus Green. <laughs> Kind of the breakaway from just serving uh, the RSPOT crowd and 
really like, I think it's fitting tonight. Like we, we've, we've tried to sort of handle the crowd too. That's why it's fitting, I think, that Professor Bill can <laughs> here for, like, for, for our, our inaugural um, one of the, the greatest scientists in the world, really. Um, so I guess like what we've tried to do this year is kind of have a diverse range of, of speakers. We've had uh, speakers from fields as diverse as uh, music, sport, theoretical physics, uh, politics, acting, economics, literature, and mathematics. Uh, with guests ranging from the Prime Minister of Sweden uh, to the first African in space. Um, but I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, most importantly, I'd like to thank our council and extraordinary members. Uh, I feel that any success this year has been completely down to their dedication, uh, their talent and their warmth. Uh, so if, if you please uh, entertain a round of applause for our council and extraordinary members this year. Understanding when I got the year off books uh, this year, and for always being supportive to me and my good friend Estelle as well. But yeah, I guess um, just kind of like really just, just in conclusion, this is the last real public event of our year, and there's, there's really no guests I'd rather have at the Phil and Orville uh, than Professor Richard Dawkins here. And um, rather embarrassing, I tried to invite him many times in the years with Phil. I uh, tried numerous different tacks over the last couple of years too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we, we got there in the end. Uh, I'm, I'm not a science student, but I'm going to try uh, now to attempt to, to give Richard a, an introduction. Um, so essentially, uh, as an evolutionary biologist, uh, um, Professor Dawkins has broadened our understanding of, genetic, of the genetic origin of our species. And as a popular author, he's helped lay readers understand uh, very complex scientific subjects on the whole. Um, Professor Dawkins has popularized, popularized uh, the gene-centric view of evolution. In his books, The Selfless Gene and The Extended Phenotype, he presents the idea that the remedial selection happens not at the individual level, but at the level of DNA. Uh, he's had a very distinguished academic career, uh, both at Berkeley and at Oxford, uh, and he's, been, he's now the respected voice of atheism and the vice president of the British Humanist Association. So ladies and gentlemen, for all those reasons, uh, I'm now proud to introduce you. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce on, to speak on the topic of Darwin's Five Bridges at Professor Richard Dawkins. It must have been designed. 
Uh, it sounds obvious, and everybody thought that was true. Hume didn't, uh, and of course Darwin showed that it definitely wasn't the case. Even Hume, though he could see that the argument to design was a bad argument logically, he couldn't think of a good alternative. He could see that it was bad logic to say, because something looks complicated, because the things that we know are complicated, like watches, are designed, therefore living things must be designed. That's just bad logic. Uh, but it was Darwin who came along after Hume's death and showed what the alternative was. Um, the argument from design was familiar to Darwin, whose cohort of Cambridge undergraduates were forced to read William Paley, uh, on natural theology. William Paley had this idea of walking along and you, in, a, in a field or a moor and you come across a watch, you pick up the watch, and you open it up and you see cogwheels and springs and, and, and nuts and bolts and, and things. Um, and you realise that it's made for a purpose. It's obviously made, obviously designed, no, no alternative to that. And Paley said, how much more so then would, be, would, would an eye or a heart or a kidney have to be designed. Um, and Darwin, uh, of course, um, showed the alternative to that, um, which is, of course, natural selection, cumulative natural selection. Natural selection is the process by which, in any generation of animals or plants or bacteria or fungi, whatever, whatever you like, there's variation, genetic variation, some individuals are better equipped by their genes to survive and therefore pass on their genes. And therefore, every generation serves as a kind of filter of genes. The filter or sieve of genes sieves out those ones that are good at surviving. And good at surviving for a gene means good at building a body that preserves it, propagates it, reproduces it. So as generations go by, animals get good at doing whatever it is they do. Birds get good at flying, fish get good at swimming, dolphins get good at swimming, moles get good at digging, monkeys get good at swinging through the trees, and so on. There are different ways of making a living. But all these ways of making a living are fundamentally the same thing going on. It is preserving genes, specifically those genes that make them good at making a living. So every animal alive, every human alive, every plant alive, can look back on a long line, an unbroken line, of successful ancestors. It's a sobering thought, it's an obvious thought, but, it's, but, but you, it, it needs saying that not a single one of your ancestors died young, not a single one of your ancestors failed to copulate heterosexually at least once. <laughs> plenty, of, plenty of other animals failed in all those respects. Plenty died young, plenty never got a mate and so on. But not a single solitary one of your ancestors did. And you have inherited the genes that made them successful in surviving, getting a mate, and rearing the children if that's appropriate for the species. Now, it's important that the process is cumulative and gradual you can't have sudden jumps. You can't have something like an eye springing into existence, perfectly formed, like, who was it, sprang from the head of Zeus, Venus, wasn't it? Come on, you're classical. <laughs> um, it's got to be gradual. It's got to, each generation has got to be just a slight improvement on the one before. And so if you think of it as a kind of landscape, a hill climbing landscape, engineers here will know what I mean, um, it has to be smooth gradients all the way. You can't have sudden jumps uh, which would require a designer. It's got to be every generation, it's got to be just slightly better than the one before, not greatly better than the one before. Now this was Darwin's idea and uh, it was seditious, revolutionary, deeply surprising. And yet it eluded not just Hume in the 18th century, but every philosopher, every mathematician, every scientist who'd ever lived before the 19th century. Uh, it was an idea that came independently into the prepared minds of at least two 19th century naturalists, Charles Darwin 
and Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, I'm not talking about evolution itself, but that's an old idea that had occurred to lots of people. It occurred to the Greeks, it occurred to Darwin's grandfather, in Erasmus Darwin, it occurred to Lamarck. Plenty of people have thought of the idea of evolution, but not in a very Darwinian way. But nobody had thought of natural selection. Nobody had thought of this non-random process whereby the generations improve because their genes equip them to survive better than their rivals. But Darwin and Wallace were not the only 19th century writers with claims to priority for the idea of natural selection. I'm going to argue that they actually did have priority, but claims could be made, have been made, for others. Patrick Matthew and Edward Blythe, for example. Um, Edward Blythe was a naturalist, uh, like Darwin and Wallace. They, they, they were all nat naturalists. They weren't philosophers. They didn't do it in an armchair. Well, I would argue that they could have done. The idea of natural selection is an idea that actually could have occurred to somebody from the depths of an armchair. It could have occurred to Aristotle, but it didn't. It had to wait for field naturalists, Darwin and Wallace, and arguably Patrick Matthew. When even, no, not Edward Blythe. Edward Blythe was a naturalist, a tropical naturalist like Darwin and Wallace. He did his work in India, uh, whereas um, Darwin and Wallace did it to Darwin all over the world, Wallace in South America and Southeast Asia. Um, Blythe, however, although he understood about natural selection, he thought of it as a purely stabilizing force. He thought of it as a negative weeding out. He thought of natural selection as penalizing those individuals who didn't survive. But he never thought of it as driving evolution in a forward direction. So in a way, Blythe was an anti-evolutionist. Indeed, he was an anti-evolutionist. He, he thought of natural selection as preserving God's creation in its pristine, archetypal state. He was the very opposite of an evolutionist. Patrick Matthew was closer. He was a Scottish horticulturalist. Uh, he grew apple and pear trees in Scotland. <coughs> and he wrote a book in 1831 on naval timber and arboriculture. His idea was that you could breed better trees for building wooden ships for the Navy. Uh, and he recognized that the principle of artificial selection, which everybody knew about, farmers know about it, dog breeders know about it, <coughs> rose breeders know about it, and Matthew was arguing for it in breeding trees. Matthew recognized that you don't have to have a, a breeder. The process by which people breed Pekingese and poodle dogs, or breed, um, turn cabbages into cauliflower and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. You know, they're all the same species. Cabbages, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, kohlrabi, um, they're all descended from the wild cabbage, Brassica oleracea. Astonishingly different. And that shows the power of selection, artificial selection. What Matthew realized, and then Darwin realized, was that you don't actually need a human breeder. Survival will do, the, will do the work, survival will do the trick. You could get the equivalent of breeding a dachshund from a wolf by natural selection, favoring those that survive. Matthew did not, like Blythe, Matthew did not see natural selection purely as a stabilizing negative force. He even went so far as to speculate that, quote, the progeny of the same parents under great differences of circumstance might in several generations even become distinct species incapable of co-reproduction. Well, when The Origin of Species was published in 1859, Patrick Matthew protested at Darwin's failure to cite him. And Darwin punctiliously did so in later editions of his book. Um, Darwin said that Matthew clearly saw the full force of the principle of natural selection. But having read Matthew's words, I'm left wondering, <coughs> did he really grasp the immense power of the discovery that he'd made? Did he appreciate that natural selection is the answer to the great riddle of existence? 
Did he see it as the explanation for all of life, the destroyer of the argument from design, Paley's argument? If he had, wouldn't he have published it in a more prominent place than the appendix to a manual on naval timber? Wouldn't he have trumpeted it from the rooftops as arguably the most important idea anyone ever had? On the contrary, Matthew seems to have found the idea so obvious, almost trivial, as not to need discovering at all. Uh, he, he complained about, about Darwin's, um, as he thought, ripping him off, in a letter to the Gardener's Chronicle. He didn't actually, he didn't use very sort of prominent places to publish these, these things. A letter to the Gardener's Chronicle, the 12th of May, 1860, he wrote, To me, the conception of this law of nature came intuitively as a self-evident fact, almost without an effort of concentrated thought. Mr. Darwin here seems to have more merit in the discovery than I have had. To me, it did not appear a discovery. He seems to have worked it out by inductive reason, slowly and with due caution to have made his way synthetically from fact to fact onwards. While with me, it was by a general glance at the scheme of nature that I estimated this select production of species as an a priori recognizable fact, an axiom requiring only to be pointed out to be admitted by unprejudiced minds of sufficient grasp. Well, with hindsight, we might be tempted to, to sympathize. I mean, it is a very, very simple idea. But where T.H. Huxley, on closing the origin of species, movingly said, how extremely stupid of me not to have thought of that. <laughs> Matthew's response would seem to be the Victorian equivalent of big deal, someone else is new. Is this the response of a man who, seven years before Darwin, found himself in possession of the central unifying idea that dominates all biology, explains everything about life? I imagine a sort of fanciful parallel. Imagine a uh, 17th century ancestor of Patrick Matthew, a contemporary of Newton, um, who, I'm imagining this ancestor of Matthew was a physicist, and he saw an apple fall in his orchard because the, Ma the Matthew family had been cultivating apples in Scotland for a long, a long for, for several centuries. <coughs> and this fancied ancestor of Patrick Matthew watched the apple fall and conjectured that the earth exerted an attractive force on apples, pulling them towards it. Well, if he had then written a letter to Newton, <coughs> indignantly claiming priority for the theory of gravitation, Newton, who was, by the way, a less generous man than Darwin, that's putting it mildly, uh, would rightly have given him short shrift. This physicist, Matthew, um, confined his theory to apples, or at best objects falling towards the earth. He lacked Newton's grand vision of the same force acting throughout the universe, responsible for the elliptical orbits of planets, stars in their courses, ultimately for the very structure of the universe itself. So I, although I sympathize with those who claim some priority for Matthew, I think he has been unkindly treated by history, but I would not credit him with full priority. He wrote in a much more obscure style than Darwin, but we can't necessarily blame him for that. But I think he just didn't get it. He just didn't grasp that this was the most important principle anybody ever thought of for explaining life, all of life, human life, animal life, plant life, and so on. Alfred Russell Wallace, 1823 to 1913, was different. He discovered natural selection later than Matthew and later than Darwin, but he does have a genuine claim to be up there with Darwin and Newton among the immortals. When Wallace hit upon natural selection, he was in no doubt of its immense importance for the whole history of life. Uh, his, the style of his writing is very, very similar to, to Darwin. Um, you probably know the drama, you've probably heard the drama of how Wallace um, wrote a letter to Darwin. Well, what Wallace thought of that natural selection, wrote a quick paper about it, and sent it to Darwin, uh, of all people, because he thought Darwin would be interested. The letter arrived at Darwin's house, Darwin House, on the 17th of June, 1858, and cast Darwin into an agony of indecision and worry. Uh, 
It's one of the more creditable and agreeable episodes in the history of scientific priority disputes, precisely because it wasn't a dispute, although it so easily could have become one. It was resolved amicably, with heartwarming generosity on both sides, actually, especially Wallace's. Wallace's paper in 1858 hit Darwin like a lightning bolt. The similarity between their thinking was uncanny. Wallace even used the phrase struggle for existence. He devoted great attention to the exponential increase in numbers, as Darwin did. Exponential increase in numbers, the population grows and grows and grows, the food supply, supply of other commodities is, is limited, and therefore competition becomes strong, therefore the fittest survive. And Wallace's language, as I say, could have been could have been Darwin himself writing. Uh, I'll just read a passage from, from Wallace which gives a, a good account of natural selection in Wallace's own words. The powerful retractile talons of the falcon and the cat tribes have not been produced or increased by the volition of those animals. But among the different varieties which occurred in the earlier and less highly organized forms of these groups, those always survived longest which had the greatest facilities for seizing their prey. Neither did the giraffe acquire its long neck by desiring to reach, the, to reach the foliage of the more lofty shrubs and constantly stretching its neck for the purpose, because any varieties which occurred among its antitypes with a longer neck than usual at once secured a fresh range of pasture over the same ground as their shorter necked companions. So you get the idea. It's a very clear illustration using giraffes as, a, as an example. Even the peculiar colours of many animals, especially insects, so closely resembling the soil, or the leaves, or the trunks on which they habitually reside, are explained on the same principle. For though in the course of ages varieties of many tints may have occurred, yet those races having colours best adapted to concealment from their enemies would inevitably survive the longest. We have also here an acting cause to account for that balance which occurred in nature. A very fashionable idea today, the balance of nature. Wallace and Darwin were uh, long ahead of their time. Historians of science have suggested that Wallace's version of natural selection was not quite so Darwinian as Darwin himself gave him credit for. Wallace persistently used the word variety or even race, as you heard in the passage I just read, as the level of entity at which natural selection acts. What is talked about a race of nothing better than another race. Um, and some people have suggested that one is thought of natural selection as indeed choosing between races. He didn't. He was using the word race to mean those individuals <coughs> who had a particular quality, like the eagles with the sharpest talons. So the eagles with the sharpest talons, the ones nowadays we would say with the genes for the sharpest talons, were the ones who survived. And that was the same with Darwin. Um, the, the subtitle of the origin of species, um, which it mentions the word, the word races, the survival of favoured races in the struggle for life. Um, once again, Darwin didn't mean races in the sense that we would mean races of geographically <coughs> separated types back with different colour or something of that sort. Once again, he meant all those individuals within a population who had the same genes. He didn't use the word genes, they didn't have a genetic concept there. As for the calumny that Darwin plagiarised Wallace, that's rubbish. The evidence is very clear that Darwin did think of natural selection long before Wallace, although he didn't publish it. We have his abstract of 1842, his longer essay of 1844, both of which establish his priority very clearly. Uh, the way that the, um, I mean, the, the, the reason why Darwin delayed 15 years or so before publishing his theory is one of the great puzzles of the history of science. Um, some people have suggested that he was afraid of the religious implications, and that's possible. Uh, his wife was very devout, his wife Emma was very devout, and we know that she was upset about Darwin's <coughs> drift towards agnosticism stroke atheism. Maybe Darwin was just a perfectionist. 
wanting to get all the evidence lined up before going public. Or maybe he just got distracted by barnacles, because he did indeed spend um, much of that time writing a learned treatise on the classification of barnacles. <laughs> when Wallace's letter arrived, Darwin was more surprised than I think many people today think he had any right to be. Uh, he wrote to Lyle, the great geologist, his mentor, I never saw a more striking coincidence. If Wallace had had my manuscript sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract of it. Even his terms now stand as heads of my chapters. <coughs> the coincidence between the two men even extended to both of them being inspired by Robert Malthus on population. Darwin wrote in his autobiography that he, uh, in 1838, happened to read for amusement Malthus on population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, which everywhere goes on from long continuous observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. Wallace's epiphany after reading Malthus was in a way more dramatic. Uh, he was suffering from malarial fever in the uh, Malay archipelago, the island of Ternati. And he said, I was, I was suffering from a sharp attack of intermittent fever, and every day during the cold and succeeding hot fits had to lie down for several hours, during which time I had nothing to do but to think over any subjects then particularly interesting me. One day, something brought to my recollection Malthus's principles of population. I thought of his clear exposition of the positive checks to increase, disease, <coughs> accidents, war and famine, which keep down the population of savage races to so much lower an average than that of more civilized peoples. It then occurs, the 19th century was all racist, you understand. <laughs> <laughs> it then occurred to me, and Wallace proceeds to his own admirably clear <coughs> exposition of natural selection as the guiding principle of all life. Now, I want to recognize a succession of bridges to evolutionary understanding. And uh, I called it Darwin's Five Bridges. I may not have time to get on to the fifth bridge, but the first four bridges I can illustrate with reference to these historical figures that I've been mentioning. Blythe, Edward Blythe, crossed the first of the four, four bridges, Patrick Matthew the first two, Wallace the first three, and Darwin all four. So the first bridge is the bridge to understanding natural selection as a negative force for weeding out the unfit. And I've used Blythe as my example for that. But Blythe was not the only person who, who realized that natural selection could do that. Um, Stephen Gould has argued that the idea of natural selection as a negative weeding out force was already widespread. Um, even Paley, according to Gould, uh, set out this purely negative version of natural selection. And as I said before, it's an anti-evolution argument. It's not an evolution argument at all. The second bridge, Darwin's second bridge, is the recognition that natural <coughs> selection can drive evolutionary change in a forward direction. In modern biological jargon, to those of you who are biologists, it amounts to the difference between stabilizing selection and directional selection. Matthew, Wallace, and Darwin all cross this second bridge. Bridge number three leads to the imaginative grasp of the importance of natural selection in explaining all of life in its richness, especially to dispelling the illusion of design. Wallace and Darwin certainly crossed bridge number three. Maybe Matthew did too, but I've given you reasons why I doubt it. Bridge four is the bridge to public understanding and appreciation. And I want to say that Darwin crossed this one alone in 1859 by writing The Origin of Species. It's a striking fact, noticed by Darwin himself, among others, that when 
Darwin and Wallace's papers were read to the Linnaean Society in London in 1858. Oh, I should have said that the, um, the way the apparent priority dispute was resolved when Wallace's paper arrived in 1858 was that Lyle and Hooker, Lyle the geologist and Hooker the botanist, um, suggested that Wallace's paper and two papers of Darwin should be read out at the Linnaean Society in 1858, thereby giving them equal priority. And this, this happened. But Darwin himself noticed, noted that nobody paid any attention, even among the professional biologists of the Linnaean Society. The end of year clangor of the capitalist president of the Linnaean Society, Thomas Bell, has become notorious and will ring on down the ages. In Bell's review of the Society's transactions, the end of the year 1858, rather like your president's review of what's happened here this, this year, um, he said that the year had not been marked by any of those striking discoveries which had once revolutionized the Department of Science on which they bear. The end of 1859 would have to be reviewed very differently. The origin of species struck the Victorian solar plexus like a steam hammer. The world of the mind would never be the same again. Neither science nor anthropology, psychology, sociology, even, and here we come close to the dark side, politics. This book, which Darwin always described as the abstract, the great book that he intended to write but never got around to, uh, achieved what the 1858 papers did not. It isn't just that the origin of species explained the theory more clearly than the 1858 papers. The real difference was that a book-length treatment was needed to muster all the evidence and lay it out for all to see. One long argument, as Darwin himself called. Darwin himself said, when the joint papers of 1858 fell flat, Darwin said, this shows how necessary it is that any new view should be explained at considerable length in order to arouse public attention. And is there a fifth bridge which Darwin himself never crossed? Well, inevitably, more than 150 years later, there are several but I want to single one out. This is the bridge to the so-called neo-Darwinism of the modern synthesis. The modern synthesis was a synthesis of Darwinian natural selection and Mendelian genetics, and it took place in the 1930s and 40s, and quite a few different people, both sides of the Atlantic, were involved in it. I would call it digital Darwinism. Um, it's digital because the essence of Mendelian genetics is digital. Uh, in Darwin's time, the word gene hadn't been invented. Heredity was a known fact. It was known that people tended to resemble their parents, animals tended to resemble their parents. But the prevailing view of heredity was a blending model was sort of thought that there was a sort of paternal substance and a maternal substance, which like two pots of paint were kind of mingled together in the offspring. So if you mix uh, black paint and white paint, you get grey. Um, and it was pointed out in Darwin's own time by a, a man called Fleming Jenkin that if this were really true, which had ever thought it was, the variation would disappear. If you mix black and white paint, you get grey. Next generation, you mix grey and grey, and no amount of mixing of grey and grey will ever get you back to black and white. So, so Jenkin pointed out, there won't be any variation for natural selection to work upon. How could natural selection choose between individuals if they're all the same? Well, um, it's a silly argument, uh, because it's not just an argument against Darwin, it's an argument against an observed fact. I mean, we do not, as a matter of fact, observe that we are more alike than our grandparents' generation, which we should be, if that premise were correct. So clearly the variation does not disappear. But nobody really understood why it didn't disappear, 
until the genetic work of Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk, uh, who was a contemporary of Darwin, was rediscovered um, in, in 1900. Mendel published his work in German. Um, it would have been the rescuing of Darwin from Leonard <coughs> Jenkins. Darwin was worried about Leonard Jenkins, but he couldn't think of the answer, and he proposed all sorts of wrong answers to the problem of blending inheritance. If only Darwin had read Mendel, he would instantly have tumbled to the solution, which is that genetics is digital. A gene is either there or it's not there. They don't blend. A gene from your grandparents passed straight through your parents to you, or didn't. There's no half measures. There's no, there's no um, blending. Either you got a particular gene from your paternal grandfather, or you didn't. That's a yes-no answer. Once you understand that that's how genetics works, that genetics is digital, then uh, there's no problem with variation disappearing. The architects of the genetic view of the modern synthesis were R.A. Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright. And they were the founders of population <laughs> genetics, which I'm calling digital genetics. Um, Sewell Wright, um, I've got a slide, but I'm not showing slides, obviously, in this, in this talk. There's a nice picture of him uh, with a guinea pig on a, on a table in front of him, because he worked on guinea pigs. And behind him, there's a blackboard with some mathematics and equations on it. The legend has it that after the photograph was taken, he picked up the guinea pig, turned around, and erased. <laughs> Even those three founding fathers, Fisher, Holding, and Wright, didn't realize quite how digital genetics really is. Uh, DNA is digital within the genes, not just between genes that we have digital genetics, within every gene. Every single gene is exactly like a computer tape. It's quaternary rather than binary, but apart from that, genetics has now become a branch of information technology. Of the three founding fathers, this was long before DNA, of course, it was Fisher who, in his great book of 1930, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, most clearly expressed the evolutionary significance of the Mendelian antithesis to blending inheritance. Um, and Fisher pointed out that Darwin himself came tantalizingly close to getting the point about digital genetics. Uh, Darwin wrote a letter, which Fisher quotes, a letter to Huxley in 1857, before the origin of the species, in which Darwin said, I have lately been inclined to speculate very crudely and indistinctly that propagation by true fertilization will turn out to be a sort of mixture and not true fusion of two distinct individuals, or rather of innumerable individuals as each parent has its parents and ancestors. I can understand on no other view the way in which crossed forms go back to so large an extent to ancestral forms. But all this, of course, is infinitely crude. Even Fisher didn't know how breathtakingly close Darwin was to Mendelian genetics. He even worked on sweet peas, like Mendel did. Darwin, in uh, 1867, which was nearly a decade after the origin of the species, wrote a letter to Wallace that began as follows. My dear Wallace, I do not think you understand what I mean by the non-blending of certain varieties. It does not refer to fertility, an instance will explain. I cross the painted lady and purple sweet peas, which are very different coloured varieties, and got, even out of the same pod, both varieties, perfect, but none intermediate. Something of this kind, I should think, must occur at first before butterflies. Though these cases are in appearance so wonderful, I do not know that they are really more so than every female in the world producing distinct male and female offspring. Now let that sink in. It's a beautiful, that last sentence, it's a beautiful example of the power of reason, the importance of seeing through the obvious. When a male mates with a female, 
you don't get a hermaphrodite. <laughs> you get either male or female in approximately equal, equal uh, probability. In a way, Mendel never needed to go into his monastery garden. All he had to do was to take the inheritance of sex itself and generalize that to all other cases of inheritance. Digital heredity was staring us in the face in the most obvious way you could imagine. The trouble was it was too obvious to be noticed. Darwin noticed it. He came close to making the connection. But just as Patrick Matthew didn't quite cross the bridge that Darwin and Wallace crossed, so Darwin didn't quite manage to cross the Mendel-Fisher bridge, at least not decisively enough. In modern genetic terms, not, these are not Darwin's own words now, natural selection can be defined as the non-random survival of randomly varying coded instructions on <coughs> how to survive. We see, we admire the products, the phenotypes of the good ones. We see legs and arms and wings and fins and gills and hearts and kidneys. We see them as tools for survival, tools for propagating, for passing on the genes that build them. But an important part of the environment, this is now coming on to quite modern times now, an important part of the environment that each gene must exploit, if it's to ensure its survival in the form of copies of itself, is the other genes that it encounters in the genomes of a succession of bodies. And that means that genes have to be selected, have to be good at cooperating with the other genes that they're likely to encounter <coughs> in a succession of bodies as populations go from generation to generation. In sexually reproducing species, evolution consists of changes in gene frequencies in gene pools. Some genes become more frequent, other genes become less frequent. The successful ones become more frequent, the unsuccessful ones become less frequent in a gene pool, in a pool of genes where you count genes. Each individual organism is built from a shuffled sample of the genes of the population, like shuffling a pack of cards. So each individual is a shuffled pack of cards. The available cards to be shuffled are sampled from the gene pool. And the statistical frequencies of these available cards change as the generations go by. That is evolution. We monitor evolution by looking at phenotypes, by looking at bodies. But what's really going on is that the genes in the gene pool are changing in frequencies. It's tempting to see natural selection as a sculptor's chisel carving the bones and flesh of the animals themselves. But if you want to talk about a sculptor's chisel, a sharper representation of evolution will see the chisel is working not on the bodies of animals, but on the gene pool, the statistical structure of the gene pool. As crests get longer, eyes get rounder, horns get longer, tails get gaudier, what's really being carved by the chisels of natural selection is the gene pool. As mutation, as random genetic variation and sexual recombination enrich the gene pool, the chisels of natural selection carve the gene pool into shape. And we see it as changes in the bodies. Bodies serve as sort of proxies for the genes, the proxies by which is to decided whether a gene shall survive in the gene pool or not. The species gene pool can be looked at as a database which becomes a storehouse of information <coughs> about the environments of the past, Envir the environments in which ancestors survived and passed on the genes that helped them to do so. So to the extent that the present environment and future environments resemble those of the past, and mostly they do, the world doesn't change capriciously. To that extent, this repository of information from the past, this description in the language of genes of the, in, of the environments of the past, this database of, of information about past environments is a good guide to how to survive in the present and the future. Each individual's genome in any one generation will be a sample from the species 
database. It's the species that has the database. Different species will have different databases because of their different ancestral worlds. Like sand bluffs carved into fantastic shapes by the desert winds, the database in the gene pool of camels will encode information about deserts and how to survive in deserts. The DNA in mole gene pools will, will be a description of the world of dark, damp, underground tunnels and how to survive there, and so on. Natural selection carves and whittles gene pools into shape, working the way through geological time. It's an image that might have seemed strange to Darwin, but I think he would have come to love it. half 
Our brothers and sisters is one half. Our for uncles and nieces is a quarter. Our for grandparents and grandchildren is a quarter. Our for um, first cousins is one eighth. Our for second cousins is one sixteenth. You can calculate R for any particular kind of, of relationship. And a gene for kindness, a gene for altruism, from one animal to another, will spread if R, B is greater than C, where R is what I've just been describing, B is the benefit to the beneficiary, for example, the niece, and C is the cost to the altruist, to the donor, to the individual being kind. Under those conditions, a gene for altruism will spread, and um, Hamilton did a beautiful example showing how this explains the social insects, ants, bees, wasps, and termites. Uh, it explains um, uh, many species of birds and mammals where siblings take care of, the, of each other and so on. Um, it was very mathematical. Um, the questioner pointed out that a, a different way of putting it, a different mathematical phraseology, was later developed by George Price, a rather tragic figure in the history of my subject. Um, and Hamilton became friendly with, with Price. Uh, and that is another way of looking at the same point, that it is a very, very important principle of evolutionary biology. And um, I would make one, one further point about it. Um, it follows logically and inevitably from the neo-Darwinian synthesis of Fisher, Aldane and Wright that I mentioned to you. It's not, as many people have misunderstood it to be, it is not a kind of additional theory that you can take or leave, or that you require additional evidence for. You cannot have the neo-Darwinian theory without kid selection, without Hamilton's, Hamilton's um, idea. It follows as inevitably as Pythagoras' theorem follows from, from Euclid's axioms. You cannot have Euclidean geometry without the Pythagorean theorem of the square and the hypotenuse. Anybody who gets out a ruler and goes around measuring right angle triangles <coughs> to see whether Pythagoras got it right, is wasting his time. <laughs> the same is true to anybody who actually um, does empirical work to see whether Hamilton got his sums right. He got his sums right. Um, the only question is whether the R great, RB greater than C terms, whether the, the values of B and C that you plug in for particular animals um, lead to altruism towards um, cousins or nephews or whatever it might be. Uh, yes. Uh, just thanks so much Professor Dawkins for coming tonight. Uh, despite the beauty and explanatory power of the 19th century science you allude to, and uh, many people view that sort of indifferent universe concept as super depressing. Uh, given that, do you think there's a merit or value in Eastern philosophy, specifically Buddhism, in terms of being a better place in the cosmos? Well, I don't really care whether it's depressing. <laughs> I don't think it is de depressing, but if I were judging um, the merits of, of Darwinian philosophy against Eastern philosophy, whether it was comforting or depressing would be the last thing I would, I would ask. I would ask, is it true? Uh, and it is. Um, it's, it's, um, and I, I don't see, I, mean, I don't know about Buddhism, I don't see Buddhism as being, uh, as being a, a competitor. If it is a competitor, and if it says something different, then it's wrong. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think it does. But, but well, I don't know why people do things depressing. I mean, it's, it's well, um, okay. I mean, Darwin himself alluded to the cruelty of natural selection. Maybe that's what you're, you're referring to. Um, if you look at something, a really elegant animal like a cheetah, this magnificent running machine, this sprinting machine that can, that can run as fast as a fast car, um, for short, short bursts, um, and the antelope that is chasing, running almost as fast. Um, these are splendid pieces of biological machinery. They're elegant, they're beautiful, they're finely tuned, finely honed. Um, but they are the product of a ruthless process of ancestral natural selection, where thousands of ancestral antelopes died in agony, probably. 
as part of the process that led to the perfection of modern antelopes. Thousands of cheetahs starved to death, ancestral cheetahs starved to death, as part of the process that perfected modern cheetahs and made them so superlatively good at running and, and um, catching their prey. So there is a grim aspect to it, and Darwin was aware of that. Darwin said um, something like, uh, I find it hard to imagine how a benevolent deity could possibly have constructed the Ignumonidae. The Ignumonidae is a group of insects, uh, a sort of wasps, which, like digger wasps, do their another sort of do this. What they do is they sting a prey, and then the prey is paralyzed by the sting, and they bury the prey and lay an egg, or several eggs, on the prey. It might be a caterpillar or something of that sort. Um, and then the, the egg hatches out and devours the caterpillar from inside. It's important that the caterpillar shouldn't decay. It's important that it, the meat should be fresh for the developing wasp larva. And so this is achieved by the sting paralyzing it, but not killing it. So if the caterpillar can feel pain, there's no reason to suppose that it's not in agony um, during the time when the wasp larva is devouring it uh, from within. Far, the great French naturalist, described how a digger wasp, another kind of wasp that does the same kind of thing, um, on catching a caterpillar, um, systematically would sting each of the ganglia, of, of an insect of a caterpillar has a series of ganglia all the way down the ventral side. And according to Farr, the, the, the wasp systematically sting each one of the ganglia um, to paralyze it. Um, and Darwin knew this, and Darwin um, thought that natural selection was a very cruel process. Uh, well, if it is, that's tough. It's true. <laughs> and that's it's why we're all here. Um, yes? Um, I just have a question about how you think we should consider um, evolutionary information about our own species, like huma, humans. So, for example, say in modern feminist theory, we have this idea that, you know, well, men and women, you know, are totally the same, and any kind of differences between them are created by a culture of yes. patriarchy or whatever. And do you think that it's, do you think that, there, that we should maybe curtail in certain instances? Also, another example, say when now they're starting to find maybe genes that would make you more predisposed to committing crime. Do you think that there should be a curtailment of, the, of our right. investigation into our own yes. genes? Should we, uh, should we, as it were, censor our sense yeah, exactly. of the interest of political or social welfare? Um, I think it's very, very important to understand that whatever biology may say about such questions as sex differences or any genetic variation in, say, criminal tendencies, um, that this does not condemn people, individual people, to behave in the way that, um, that there, there may be a statistical difference between, say, males and females. Um, but it would be a terrible fallacy to say that because there might be evolutionary reasons, which there are actually, for expecting there to be differences in male and female psychology, um, that therefore all females are this way and all males are that way. What we've probably got is a pair of normal distributions which are very closely um, overlapping. Uh, and um, it, it's true that if you look at the biological theory, there are reasons to expect differences in male and female behavior in certain, certain regards. <coughs> Tendencies to promiscuity versus, um, versus monogamy, for example. Um, there's a notorious experiment that was done uh, by Darwinian psychologists in America on an American campus. Um, they got um, male and female stooges to walk around a university campus uh, and accost, approach students walking around the campus and say they had a particular form of words they had to say. They would approach a member of the opposite sex. So they had female stooges and male stooges who uh, would approach members of the opposite sex and say one of three things. Um, they all began by, I've been noticing you around campus. <laughs> and, um, and I wondered whether you would um, have a date with me, um, with, if you would come back to my room, that's the second question. 
or would you sleep with me? Was the third, was the third question. Um, and um, when f females, no, when when males asked females those those three questions, not a single female said yes to the "Would you sleep with me?" Um, and a, a minor, I forget the figures, but a, but a, a minority said yes. The, the, these stooges were, were chosen to be quite attractive. Um, <laughs> a, a minority, I think it was, of females said yes, they would have a date. Um, when females approach males with those three questions, um, seventy percent of the males said yes to the "Will you sleep with me?" <laughs> So, I mean, that's a colossal difference. And even those who said no, said no in a sort of apologetic tone of voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this experiment arouses the ire of the feminists, uh, um, but it, it does seem to be robust. I mean, it's been, it's been repeated. It, it, and it certainly accords with evolutionary expectation. There are very good evolutionary reasons to expect um, females to be much more fussy, much more discriminating, much more discerning um, than, than males. Really fundamentally because um, a female uh, in, in a reproductive world where, where, um, where sex is related to, to reproduction, um, reproduction is a major investment of a female's time, effort, body, um, life. A male, theoretically, can sow wild oats and just walk away. Uh, and so you would expect natural selection to have favoured male brains that, that were, um, had a tendency towards promiscuity, female brains that had a tendency towards, towards um, being fussy. Uh, and um, the empirical data, as I say, do, do tend to support it. But the important thing is that if you're male, if you're female, it doesn't mean you, you, are, you, are, you have to do that. It doesn't mean you have to behave like that. You're free to do whatever you like. You're free to say, I'm female, but I want to behave in a promiscuous way. Or I'm male, but I want to be faith faithful in another way. And many people do that, of course. Um, so uh, I think it's... <laughs> You're no more condemned by your genes than you are by your upbringing. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in the first world, the first world, you know, for modern medicine and religion in the age of technology, I mean, would it be fair to say that, like, we're not struggling for our existence anymore, that it's not necessary to survive with the fittest. So I suppose, like, where do you see, what kind of role do you see natural selection playing in, in, in humans of the yes. next? Um, well, it's true that in, that in, in, advanced, um, in, in advanced countries like, like this one, where you, where you have doctors and hospitals, and it's quite difficult to die young. Um, that means that the obvious cutting edge of natural selection is blunted. Because dying young is really what natural selection is about. Dying before you've had a chance to reproduce um, is pretty much what natural selection is about. Um, most people in the Western world um, live long enough to reproduce. Whether they reproduce or not is not up to whether they're alive or dead, but whether they, often whether they choose to, to, uh, to reproduce. Um, or maybe cultural effects, may, they may belong to a religion which encourages them to reproduce, or another religion that doesn't. Um, they may be, um, uh, they may attempt to use contraception and be a bit incompetent at it. And, um, <laughs> I mean, there may be some of us in the room today who owe our existence to our parents' incompetence. In <laughs> I mean, if there were a genetic component to such incompetence, then by definition we have natural selection in favour of incompetence. Um, it might be general incompetence, or it might be specific incompetence with respect to some particular method of contraception. So, um, I suppose the point I would want to make from this is that although theoretically we have natural selection in favour of something like that, the detail of exactly what's being favoured by natural selection would be so culture-specific, so culture-dependent, that it's very unlikely 
that the same pressures, the same evolutionary pressures will be going on in 50,000 years time, which would, it would need to be if we're going to get a kind of interesting evolutionary change as a result of uh, this kind of thing. So, um, I would think the natural selection hasn't stopped in, in Western society, but it's kind of wavering about in a rather mad, sort of sawtooth, crazy way uh, in, uh, for, for, for that kind of characteristic. There is still selection <coughs> put for, but, but against diseases which do kill um, before you reduce. Um, and diseases that kill um, not in childhood, but, but after you've reproduced, but not when you've had a child to reproduce very I mean, a, a, a lethal gene that kills you when you're 20 has a chance of getting through to the next generation because some people reproduce before they're 20. A lethal gene that kills you when you're 30 has a much better chance of getting through. A lethal, a lethal gene that kills you when you're 80 gets through the whole time, I mean, which is why we tend to die when, you know, when, we're, when we're 80 because we'd, we've got all these lethal genes um, which have got through the generations because people have always, have always done their reproduction before they're 80. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. Sorry, um, with the development of artificial reproduction um, treatments, do you believe, what do you think about parents intervening in the enhancement of their children's genes? Parents? Parents um, intervening with the enhancement of their children's genes, like design babies and that kind of thing. I didn't quite get the but what, what sort of enhancement are you thinking of? Genetic enhancement of... Right. Do you, do you mean um, sort of um, designer babies? That, that kind yeah, of thing? exactly. Yes. Um, well. Okay. Yes. Um, this, this is a politically sensitive topic. Um, uh, eugenics, and um, eugenics was all the rage uh, before Hitler. And um, <laughs> it's not that um, and. Um, you probably want to make a distinction between negative eugenics and positive eugenics, where negative eugenics would be where you decide that you do not want to have a baby who has a certain, as say, Huntington's chorea. Huntington's disease is a very, very horrible disease. Um, it's a dominant gene uh, which kills you in middle age. And um, if you've got it, you're doomed. And um, if you're a parent who knows that you if you're a parent with Huntington's disease, sorry, if you're an adult with Huntington's disease, um, you know that each one of your children has a 50% chance of inheriting it, this terrible, terrible scourge. Um, so if you were, if you did have Huntington's disease, you knew you're doomed yourself, but you wanted to know you might like to have a child. Um, what you could do is, is conceive a child by in vitro fertilization, IVF. In IVF, you get a petri dish with, say, um, 10 young um, embryos, four, four cell, eight cell em embryos. Um, you can extract one cell from an eight cell embryo and look at its genes. Uh, if not for Huntington's, that, that it will be that the technology will be available very soon to do that. It probably will, will really is. So you've, you've, got a, you've got, roughly speaking, 50% of the embryos in the petri dish will have the Huntington's gene, and the other 50% won't. So obviously what you do is you choose to implant into the woman one of the embryos, two of the embryos, that do not have the Huntington's gene. Uh, so that's negative eugenics, and it's hard to imagine anybody objecting to that. Positive eugenics, where you, where you say, I want to have a baby with blue eyes, or I want to have a baby who's good at mathematics, or good at music, or something like that. Um, that's probably not yet very feasible yet, but it will be. A lot of people object to it. Um, I'm one of those who doesn't really object as strongly as others. I mean, I can't really see the harm in, in saying, or, or put it this way, um, we are already quite accustomed to the idea that parents who want their child to be musical drill the child to have music lessons and insist that the child practices the piano, whatever it is. And so we're already accustomed to the idea that parents have a certain right to, to educate their child 
in the way that they want, to, to make the child into a good musician by education. Um, now, I think you could object to that. You could say, well, poor child, you know, don't force it to practice the piano if it doesn't want to. Um, but if you accept that, that forcing the child to have music lessons is okay, then it's not obvious to me why giving the child musical genes in the first place would be any less moral than that. Now, you could probably find good, good reasons against it. Um, however, that's an unfashionable view, and, and um, most um, ethicists are against the idea of positive eugenics. I don't think any, any serious eugenicists are against, sorry, ethicists are against the idea of the negative eugenics. Yes. And you spoke briefly there about the theory of evolution. I was wondering what your thoughts are on Kurzweil's idea of singularity. Yes, I don't know much about it. Um, it it's, it's clearly um, uh, a, a rather science fiction-y idea. It could be right. I mean, you know, it's, it's good that, to have people like that making speculative suggestions. And his speculation is about the rather close future, the rather, the rather near, near future. Um, but I, I don't have a view on these particular, on Kurzweil's particular, particular idea of the singing about today. Time for one more question. One more question. Um, uh, I think we'll chat with that. Thank you. I'd like to be an honest scientist who's learned tonight. Thank you very much. I'm more than happy to, to come back about six minutes from Taiwan. Well, um, where, where, where do you go right, um, perfection is, is a difficult concept. Um, Sorry, you, you use the word. Yes. Um, for one thing, um, the, an animal's body is, is a, a compromise between different things. And, and if, if, it's, if it's perfect for, say, running fast, you could imagine racehorses. Racehorses have been artificially selected to run faster than wild horses. Um, but the price of that is that their legs break. And so, um, as long as they are kind of um, cosseted and looked after by humans, um, then you can select for a quality like fast running in, a, in, in racehorses. But it wouldn't work in, in, in nature. There would have to be a compromise between being very good at running, and very good at not having your legs break all the time. Um, similarly, um, you can select Friesian cows to give hugely more milk than wild cows ever, ever would. And the cost of that is that the, it, 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 the British cow has this great swinging thing between its back legs that make it very bad at running, so it would get, get eaten by the first lion um, that, that came upon it. So. Um, Perfection you have to see as a compromise between different, different pressures, and it's very obvious in things like the compromise between looking beautiful to attract the opposite sex, like a peacock, and being efficient at getting away from predators. And the peacock's hopeless at getting away from predators. <laughs> it's got this great burden on its back. Um, so that, that's one reason to, to, to not expect perfection. There are others. Um, there's the legacy of history. Um, Natural selection cannot look to the distant future and say, there's perfection over there, we're here for it. It doesn't do that. It blindly follows the path of least resistance. It blindly follows <coughs> the immediate benefit. So, um, I mean, a, a, a beautiful example of this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, if there are medics here, you'll know, you'll know what, the, what this is. It's a nerve, it's a branch of one of the cranial nerves. It comes from the brain. And the end organ is the larynx, the voice box. Uh, but it doesn't go straight there. Instead, it goes down into the chest, loops around one of the main arteries in the chest, and then goes back up again to the larynx. That's a, a wasteful and pointless detour. That's bad design. In a giraffe, that's a, a detour of an extra 15 feet. <laughs> I've actually assisted in the dissection of a giraffe's neck to, in order to 
trace the distance in this letter. Indeed, it does go all the way down. It goes within an inch of the larynx. Instead of just going straight there, it goes way, way down, roaring past the larynx, down into the chest, all the way down the giraffe's neck, turns around and comes straight back up again. Now, that's the legacy of history. That's because in our fish ancestors, the most direct route from the brain to what was then the equivalent of the larynx, fish don't have a larynx, but the then equivalent of the larynx, was south of this particular, the equivalent of this particular artery. So that was then the most direct route. As the mammals, as the, as the terrestrial vertebrates evolved from the fish, the neck got longer and longer and longer. By millimeter by millimeter, the neck got longer. And fish don't have a neck. Uh, as, the neck did, as the neck evolved, the additional cost of one millimeter of diversion, of detour of this nerve, was negligible. <coughs> Economists will notice the marginal cost. The marginal cost of an additional millimeter of, of um, diversion was negligible compared with the very considerable cost of the embryological upheaval that it would have taken to uh, change the entire embryological development of, of this nerve. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a legacy of history. It's an imperfection. Any designer would be sacked for such a piece of bad design. And there are lots of examples. I mean, a famous one is that the retina the vertebrate retina is back to front. Um, and this again is his, his legacy of history. Um, the mollusk retina, something like an octopus or a squid, has the retina the right way round. But otherwise, the eye is very similar. We, we have a camera eye with a lens um, and, a, and a retina. But in the, in the octopus eye, the photocells, if you can call them that, face towards the light. And the wires leading from the photocells to the brain come backwards, which is where any sensible engineer would put them. But in the vertebrate eye, the photocells face backwards, and the wires that connect the photocells, the rods and cones, to the brain, run over the surface of the retina, presumably getting in the way of the light. Uh, they're not too bad, they could be can't see after all. Uh, and then they dive through the retina into the optic nerve in the so-called blind spot. Well, that's atrociously bad design. Uh, and again, it's a legacy of history. It's something to do with the way uh, eyes originally developed. They did it differently. Octopuses and, and vertebrates developed eyes quite independently of each other. And because of the different ways in which they did it at the start, vertebrates carried on because the marginal cost of turning the retina around would have been huge.